Hi, I'm Peter J. Ray. Welcome. Today's topic is Restless Remarkable Books 46. The first book today is The Land I Lost, Adventures of a Boy in Vietnam by Hu Yu Quang Nhong, 1982. Now, the author, uh, I believe, moved to the United States as an adult and uh, was living in the U.S., and then he was recalling his very rural childhood in Vietnam. And I think he left because of the Vietnam War. Anyway, it's an amazing, it's an amazing account of, of this very, as I mentioned, very rural childhood. He talks about the animals, uh, danger, simple living. Actually, there was uh, a lot of uh, jungle, wild animals. He talks about his, uh, the family water buffalo. And the thing that I remember about the book is monkeys. These monkeys that were wild monkeys that would uh, be in the trees, and they, the people were kind of battling them. You know, the monkeys would be in the trees. Yeah, they would throw stuff at people, <laughs> kind of a sort of this uh, conflict. And uh, and uh, the actually interesting thing is the one of the monkeys uh, became a uh, they they able they were able to I don't know somehow they captured a monkey and they turned it into a drug addict, and it became like a slave. So it had to, and you know, it, it was free to come and go, but it, because of this, because of the, uh, I think it was opium, they, they fed it opium, and it, I can't remember what it, what kind of work it did for them. But anyway, very interesting. You could see the, the author was very wistful for this uh, lost childhood, because he's living in the U.S. where it's, you know, not a tropical climate, and, not, and certainly not, you know, not this, uh, you know, not surrounding by a tropical rainforest. Very wonderful book. The, me- the next book is The Making of the President, 1972, by Theodore H. White, 1973. Yeah, he, uh, I had already read, before I read this, uh, his books on the 1960, 1964, and 1968 presidential elections, which were all tremendous. Anyway, in 1972, Richard Nixon was the incumbent. He was uh, running for re-election, and he was the Republican nominee, and he faced George McGovern, the Democratic nominee. And there was still all this chaos in, in our country, in the U.S., uh, dealing with the Vietnam War and the, the youth rebellion of the time. Anyway, uh, McGovern uh, didn't really have much of a chance. McGovern didn't, uh, McGovern, I think, only won one state, Massachusetts. At one point, his uh, vice presidential nominee was Tom Eagleton. But then the scandal came out, that, uh, or the story came out, that he'd had... He'd had depression, and I believe he was uh, had been hospitalized. So he had to he withdrew because eh, people thought, "Oh, he's not fit." You know, we weren't very progressive country. We thought, "Oh, he's mentally ill. Can't can't become vice president." And then uh, McGovern picked Sergeant Shriver, who was the, actually the married into the Kennedy family. I think was married to one of the Kennedy sisters. Anyway, uh, Vietnam. Uh, Watergate was actually, you know, getting, was in process, although it had not become the national scandal. Nation in turmoil. The, you know, the Democrats' problem is they, they had so many, they really had so many uh, sort of radical groups that sort of took, took, took control of the party and uh, turned people off. People, you know, regular Americans were thought, well, my gosh, what's going on with the Democrats? They really became sort of extreme leftists. Anyway, McGovern was a good guy. It was an interesting election. And uh, anyway, so fine book. Theodore H. White d- does tremendous, did tremendous job writing books on American presidential elections. The next book is The Story of the Bahamas by Paul Albury, 1975. Wow, this is an amazing book. What a fascinating history the Bahamas has had. This small archipelago independent country off the coast of Florida and we can it's considered a Caribbean country but actually it's in the Atlantic Ocean and uh, uh, so this is he goes way back the, the the original people the Lucayans who were who were an American Indian people and they were very peaceful and gentle wonderful people and then the, but they faced the murderous Carib Indians who were coming from the south and you know would raid make raids into the Bahamas and then, actually, the, the disaster is when the Spanish came. You know, the Spanish arrived, and uh, there was contact. And they tried to, the Spanish tried to enslave the Lucayan Indians in the Bahamas. 
and then there was disease. And actually, uh, all of the Lucayans died, I, I believe. They all, they all died. It's, actually, the Bahamas is a beautiful country. It was very, this is really tragic. Just imagine. What a tragedy. This ent- entire race of people uh, died. So um, anyway, uh, this, there were pirates. Eventually, um, uh, the Bahamas became a, a British colony, colony of Great Britain. And they had these English immigrants there, and then they brought in uh, African slaves to, to, to work for them. So it was a British colony for a very long time, and then it became an independent country in, uh, I think, in the 60s. Yeah, so it was a, our family started going there in 1965, and it was, it was a poor country back then. But, uh, but actually, uh, with time... In the 70s, 80s, 90s, because of primarily because of tourism, the Bahamas has become a rich country. And well, there was also a problem with um, with uh, drug trafficking, cocaine being dropped off on its the way from Colombia and South America to the U.S. So, a real interesting country, and our family's been going there, and it has it has changed a lot. Uh, but it's uh, yeah, it's it's a rich country now. Really interesting. It's really been through. Talk about uh, talk about drama and changes that what that country has been through. Very interesting. The next book is Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury, 1953. This was a book that our son Tim was supposed to read for high school at Rocky River High School, and I decided to read it because he he had it. I'm not sure if he read it, but uh, it was actually it's a futuristic, uh, very pessimistic, very depressing. Uh, a future for the world that's depicted in this novel. Very high tech, but it's kind of a cruel world. And there are no books. There are no books. Books have been taken away, I guess, because this it's depicting a, you know, a sort of a, a tyrannical government that doesn't want people to think. And uh, uh, But there are rebels, book lovers. And uh, it also mentions nuclear war and firemen who burn houses and books. Yeah, so this is the thing that they're, according to this this novel or in this novel, you know, the government does is very much against books. You know, I know it's interesting in the Philippines years ago during the Spanish era, Filipinos were afraid to have books in their home, because the Spanish, if they found out you had a, had books, they they considered you a possible rebel. They thought, oh, he's this these people are thinking, so you could get in trouble. So, kind of reminded me of that. So anyway, this is. Real interesting book, and it's, I guess it's considered a classic. It's being taught in American high schools today. The next book is Turning the Tide, One Man Against the Medellin Cartel by Sidney D. Kirkpatrick, 1992. This book is set in a wonderful book, amazing. It's set in Norman's Key in the Bahamas. And our family actually unwittingly was... Uh, uh, a part of this this whole scene because we used to fly into Nassau and then we'd uh, often t- take a uh, uh, fly into this Norman's Key and then take a boat from Norman's Key to our island, Cistern Key. And anyway, during that time, from 1978 to 1982, a Colombian drug dealer, Carlos Lader, uh, actually started buying property on Norman's Key and he basically intimidated all of the people to leave. You know, through, uh, I think he made threats, and he wanted, and he used Norman's Key as a place to drop cocaine that would he that would be brought by small airplane into onto the island, and then and then from there it would be brought to Florida in the United States. And um, anyway, this uh, that's what he was doing, and we we knew something was going on. It was kind of a spooky when we would pass through. Anyway, this a fellow named Richard Novak, who was a uh, American marine biologist, and he got involved. He, he was a love love the ocean and the sea, and he 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 came to the island unwittingly. I think he was uh, studying hammerhead sharks, and he met Carlos later, and later actually hired him for a time, you know, to to be a marine biologist on the island, and eventually uh, this. Uh, this fellow Richard Novak find, realized what was going on, and that th- this Carlos later was no good. He was a big-time drug dealer. In fact, I believe he invented uh, crack cocaine, which was more powerful. And so he went to war. Believe it or not, with uh, this marine biologist went to war with uh, Carlos later, 
and because uh, he he felt so bad that what what was going what had happened that he was turning this beautiful island this area into you know a place for, for a drug dealing refuge. So he was a very very brave man, lover of nature, and he, he fought this greedy guy. You know this guy who was you know really a terrible person. You know making all this money from from drug dealing, and uh, eventually he succeeded. Yeah, it was really this is a really an amazing. It's a true story and. Where I finally, our our family had gotten a copy of the book, and I, I read it, and I thought, wow. And then I I, I said, Dad, you got to read this because it had been sitting around the house. And I know he read it, really enjoyed it. Wonderful book. The next book is Napoleon by Emil Ludwig, 1926. Wow, what an incredible biography of Napoleon Bonaparte, who was a genius. You know, he was the leader of France way back when in the early the early 1800s following the French Revolution, which had the, uh, the slogans, liberty, equality, and fraternity. And they were talking about creating the United States of Europe. Uh, yeah, they had their revolution, and they were trying to spread these ideals, but then they, they ended up going to war with all of Europe, including England, Russia, Austria, and Spain. And one time, actually, this was, you could call it uh, France's heyday as an empire when France dominated Europe. And... Uh, but uh, eventually, uh, Napoleon was he, Napoleon rose through the ranks because of these wars, and he was a very he was a young guy. I think he was only in his thirties when he became like the dictator of France. And then for a time, he was eventually he got to France was defeated, and then he was put on. He had this uh, he was placed on this island of of, of Elba in the in the Mediterranean, and. Uh, as a prisoner, but eventually he escaped, and then he had got power again, and then was able to uh, start, you know, fighting, and then eventually he was captured later and put on Saint Helena, Helena Island, in in the in the south or in the Atlantic Ocean, off the off the coast of Africa, pretty tropical climate, and uh, anyway, so it's real interesting. Democracy and dictatorship, just losses. I know he eventually, at one point, Napoleon invaded Egypt, and uh, yeah, and, and he was making his way north. He had these prisoners that he just he just killed them because he didn't want to. He couldn't take care of them, and then he he, he didn't want them to have to fight them again. Lots of death. He was Napoleon was a very self confident, energetic man. Had a, had a real imagination, and I think he was a great man, inspirational. And as I read this book, I felt strength. I felt empowered by reading it. And, and the way, you know, he, some people considered him a monster for all the death that he brought to Europe, but he, he spread the ideals of the French Revolution, which were so important to these countries where the people were really, you know, beaten down by a culture of the nobility and kings and, in a sense, well, we're the common people, we're no good. But these ideals brought the idea that everyone's equal and everyone deserves respect and uh, this, this really inspired real changes, actually, in all of Europe and all the world. In fact, the Philippines was aff- affected. Eventually, it inspired uh, uh, Filipinos to fight for independence, actually. So this is a wonderful book. Napoleon Bonaparte, what a, what a guy. The next book is Seven Years in Tibet by Heinrich Herer, 1954. Wow, an ama- this is an amazing book. This German fellow... He was actually in uh, India when the Second World War broke out, and he was arrested because India was a, a British colony, and he became a prisoner of war in India. And then he eventually he escaped and made his way to Tibet in 1943. He spent seven years in Tibet, and uh, that's where you get the title. And uh, he, uh, he made it to Lhasa, the capital. He had a real adventure, plenty of suffering, you know, on this on this trip because he wanted to get away from the British. And then he met these amazing Tibetan people who were so peaceful and spiritual. He became uh, the tutor to the Dalai Lama. But then tragically, and when, the, when, when, the, um, when China invaded Tibet, I guess in 1950, he had to leave after the Chinese invasion because, uh, you know, he was, at that time, the Chinese didn't want foreigners in China, and then Tibet became a part of China. And then he wrote this. He was, he was heartbroken when he had to leave, had to leave Tibet. Quote, Wherever I live, I shall feel homesick for Tibet. Part of my being is indissolubly linked with that dear country. 
And he was German, and he, he became a Tibetan. You know, he basically became Tibetan, wanted to live the rest of his life there. What a tragedy when the Chinese came into Tibet. On the other hand, you know, the, the good part is that the Tibetan, I think, by invading Tibet and making Tibet a part of China, the Tibetans had, have, have been able to have an influence on China, helping make China more spiritual, and actually the whole world. Tibet, Tibet is actually more famous now because of this, and uh, hopefully... Tibet will become independent. I don't. The Chinese are very uh, stubborn about it. In fact, if uh, you know, if 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 any country like meets any national leader meets with the Dalai Lama, that the Chinese get very very upset. So anyway, Tibet and India. That's in our church. We believe are the two spiritual countries in the world. Two most spiritual countries. Wonderful book. The next book is I Manage Good, but boy did they play bad by Jim Bowden with Jim with Neil Offen, 1973. Well, this is a book about uh, some of the famous managers in baseball history, like John McGraw from the old New York Giants, Casey Stengel from the, from the Yankees, Connie Mack from the Philadelphia A's, Leo DeRocher, who moved around, Dick Williams, who had a lot of success, and then uh, Jim Bowden's favorite, beloved Joe Schultz from the 1969 Seattle Pilots. And uh, I remember the Schultz would always say the same thing. Like he goes, let's go out and beat those guys and then pound beer after the game. They would drink beer after these games. It was an interesting baseball book. The next book is Path of the Pale Horse by Paul Fleischman, 1983. This is a children's book. It's a novel set in Philadelphia in 1793. There's a yellow fever epidemic. Really tough. And this boy, his name is Lep and Dr. Peel... They battled ignorance, superstition, and greed to save lives. Yeah, you know, back in the old days, 1793 people, you know, there we didn't know very much. We didn't. I don't think people people didn't know about bacteria, you know, and how disease could spread. And there were a lot of false ideas. And anyway, in this book, you had a doctor who, for his time, was more knowledgeable and trying to help in this disaster. I think 10% of the people died in that yellow fever epidemic. So this is a wonderful. A historical book for children, or actually anyone. I really enjoyed it myself. The next book is Miracle Man by Nolan Ryan with Jerry Jenkins, 1992. Wow, what a book. This uh, tremendous baseball pitcher played for the New York Mets, the California Angels, the Houston Astros, and the Texas Rangers. And he had a Boy, he was known for his strike, all the strikeouts that he had. And he, he threw seven no-hitters. Wow, nobody's anywhere near that. Yeah, he, and uh, from the late 1960s to the early 1990s, and I think his he set the record for strikeouts in a season and a career, I believe. Now he's involved with the, he has a top position with the Texas Rangers. And he's from, he's from Texas. Good fellow, Nolan Ryan. Wonderful book. The next book is You're Out and You're Ugly Too. Confessions of an Umpire with Attitude by Derwood Merrill with Jim Dent, 1998. Yeah, so another um, a book by a baseball umpire. You can see these sports books became popular, and baseball is very popular, and even the umpires would write. Of course, they have this very tough job. He talks about guys like Lou Pinella, Reggie Jackson, and Robbie Alomar, and the fans in Texas. So this is interesting, if you're into baseball, to get the umpire's perspective of this Derwood Merrill was quite a character. The next book is The Creature from Jekyll Island, A Second Look at the Federal Reserve by G. Edward Griffin, 1994. Wow, this is one of the best books I've ever read, uh, along with Sugar Blues. It's a, it was a gift from my friend Joe Schaefer. And it's a, it's a book, it's about the history of banking. And you think, what could be more boring than that? But it's, it's not, it's really interesting. And according to this book, it's very it's actually a long book, and if you read it, you'll be convinced. And he makes the case that big banks have conquered the world, that they have the real power, and people don't know it. People, you know, you think of the governments having power, but they really don't. And actually, they want the bank. The big bankers want it that way. You know, they have uh, they're they're powerful and very wealthy, but they they're not famous, and, and they don't want the public. They like the system we have now where the public blames political leaders for the problems in the world or in different countries. Because, uh, 
And there's this banking government conspiracy. Yeah, they, they, the politicians are beholden to the big bankers because they need, of course, they need money to uh, fund their campaigns. And he makes the case that the Cold War, the whole Cold War, you know, the fight against communism was a big fraud because actually New York bankers funded these, uh, the Russian uh, revolutionaries who turned Russia into, into a communist country. And then we had this, um, you know, this long conflict. And they make money from war. Another way they, another hocus pocus, because war involves, you know, government spending, and the banks are part of this, and uh, and the public is really, uh, and wars are kind of a distraction. And then, and then the one of the big things is inflation. That how people, you know, you have your money, and the prices are always going up. And because we have a really, we have a horrible banking system today, the politicians are tools of the money men. Big bankers rule the world, steal from the public, and it's a secret. So I highly recommend this book. We really recommend this book. That We really need a new banking system. There's been calls, and it started with the Federal Reserve. Well, not, not only that, well, at least in the U.S. You know, they had these national banks in Europe. And uh, with the Federal, the Federal Reserve is this corrupt institution, which allows the uh, big banks to basically you know, make these bad loans and get away with it. And the and the, and the and the and the government bails them out. So this this is an incredible book and uh, I really mind boggling. And, and then the thing is, you try to tell people about it and they're they're like, oh, you're crazy. But re- you read the book. Anybody could read this book and then think, see for yourself. See if you think differently. Most people won't probably won't read the book. The next book is What Parents Need to Know About Learning by Henry S. Tened, Tenedero, 2005. Now, this is, a, this is a very good book. The Every child is different and learns differently. Teachers should be creative and keep experimenting. Yeah, and uh, in my case, uh, I need to meditate more so I can have more wisdom and energy and creativity and patience. And Because, yeah, the tendency in schools is for the children all to be treated the same, and they all have to do the same things, even though we're all different. And when we enter the workforce, there are all these different jobs we can do. So we really, yeah, we need to do, I guess the schools are doing this as, be, as well as they can do right now, but in the future, schools will be better as human beings evolve more. So books like this are a contribution to that noble cause. The next book is So Many Enemies, So Little Time by Eleanor Burkett, 2004. Now the author, she lived in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan for one year. That's in Central Asia, one of the obscure area that used to be part of the Soviet Union. She visited Iraq, Kazakhstan, Afghanistan, Iran, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, these, these, these countries in Central Asia. Very strong-willed American woman who tries to understand other peoples. And then there's these issues of terrorism, communism, tradition, and modernism. All these different forces that have made life so complicated. You know, these Islamic jihadists, you know, are making trouble. And then, of course, communism is still, a, well, still an issue with, you know, it's radical governments, which is appealing to the poor. Of course, tradition. Tradition is always something that uh, we're a very important part of, or, of the world. And modernism, you know, the modern world, all, all these different things going. It's people so confused, very confusing world. Very interesting. The next book is To Die a Thousand Deaths, a novel on the life and times of Lorenzo Ruiz by Celso A. Carunungan, 1980. Wow, what an amazing book, The Filipino Saint. It's set, this is a, he lived in the early 1600s. We know that the Philippines became a Spanish colony and became Catholic, for the most part, in in the late 1500s, following the Spanish conquest. And then there were Filipinos involved in in the missionary movement to spread Christianity in other parts of Asia, including Japan. And this Lorenzo Ruiz traveled to Japan with some Spanish priests. And early on, early, uh, actually there was an interest in in Japan, an interest in Christianity, but eventually the the government decided to outlaw Christianity. They thought it was, oh, it was kind of a threat to their power. So Lorenzo Ruiz died in Japan because of his... uh, he was, uh, he was tortured and killed and executed. But, uh, you know, he, he remained faithful. It's a very inspiring story, very interesting, wonderful history. And uh, this is, uh, you know, and you've probably heard in 
it's, I know in the Philippines, people were all happy because he became the, he was recognized as a saint by the Catholic Church. Wonderful story. Good history. The next book is The Golden Door, The Life of Catherine Drexel, a great American woman who devoted her life and fortune to the Indian and Negro, Negro races by Catherine Burton, 1957. My sister Patricia gave me this book, and it's a story, it's a true story of a woman who worked hard to build schools for American Indians and African Americans. Her father's banking fortune she spent serving God. Very inspiring. You know, she inherited all this money, and she, and she did a lot of good with it because uh, build, building schools for people who needed them, who didn't have them, for especially for these people who are struggling, the American Indians and African Americans who had been having a tough time. Good job. Wonderful, wonderful history. Very inspiring. The next book is General Washington's Christmas Farewell by Stanley Weintraub, 2004. Well, this, is a, this takes a short period of time from the life of George Washington. It's a wonderful book. It's late November, 1783. The American War of Independence has been won, and George Washington is the hero. He's, he's saying goodbye and going home to Mount Vernon for Christmas. He's giving up power and promoting democracy. Yeah, I see the, the war was over, and you see, he, there was, he was under some pressure. He, was the, he had military power, and some people wanted him to uh, transition into political power immediately because we had a bad government, and... Uh, Especially the soldiers in the American Revolution had not been treated well. Had not there, there was back pay. They hadn't been paid, and so. But he said no. You know, I was he. He'd finished his mission. He'd won the war, and he was he resigned his commission. He wanted to go home, and because uh, he 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 wanted and, and he had no mandate to be a political leader. He wasn't going to break the law. He believed in doing the right thing, and he made it home on Christmas Eve, seventeen eighty three. And the Mount Vernon was kind of falling apart, but he finally made it home. And and because he, you know, later, of course, he was elected president, but uh, that's, that's a different story. And uh, so, anyway, wonderful book, uh, wonderful history, very inspiring man, George Washington. The next book is Ceremony by Leslie Marmon Silko, 1977. This is a story of, a, of, Amer of an American Indian. World War II veteran and his struggles. He's a, you know, he, an American Indian who served in the U.S. Army in the war. And he has these uh, tough memories. You know, these guys are really, that's one of the big problems they have, the memories of, of, of what they went through, all the death and the suffering, destruction. People, guys they knew who died and maybe people that they had killed. And again, he has to deal with the white man's world. He's an American Indian. So he faces issues of violence among his people. Alcoholism, one of the big problems with American Indians. Spirituality. Actually, Indians did have a, do have a tradition of, of strong spirituality and nature. Wonderful book about this fellow. The next book is Our Lady's Fool, St. Maximilian Mary Kolbe by Stephen Mary Manelli, 1976. This is a story of a, a Catholic priest who was he was Polish, and he's uh, he is now recognized as a saint by the Catholic Church. Extremely devoted to Divine Mother, to God, he was killed by the Nazis at Auschwitz during World War II. Very hard worker, very good man. Wonderful story. And Maximilian Kolbe really did a good job of of serving God, and you know, risked his life. And I believe he went to Auschwitz because you know he cared about these. What was going on with these? Really wanted to help the Jewish people. And, you know, he wasn't afraid to die. Wonderful story. And so, anyway, so, did a good job. Well, it appears we're out of time. Thank you very much for watching. God bless you. Live long and prosper. And I'll see you next time.